Welcome, everybody. Welcome to Family Weekend 2017. I hope you've had a great start to this fun weekend, and, and hopefully you've seen your, your kids already. Um, so um, this is especially exciting for me for two reasons. One is that the MIT Parents Association is a part of the MIT Alumni Association, and this year, I'm, an, I'm the class of 83 alumni volunteer since I graduated, and I'm serving as the Alumni Association president. So I'm happy to be part of this and, um, and so thrilled that the Alumni Association can be um, the stewards to your engagement as a family with your student here. Uh, the association is committed to students and families and that it's all, we're all part of um, the umbrella of people who love MIT. And uh, this past year, we had a program committee in the association that looked at constituents that aren't graduates of MIT, and we really focused on how, I mean, what are the ways that we can engage um, the, the non-alum um, constituents, and we've already begun with lots of initiatives to make those connections happen. Anyways, I'm, the second part why I'm thrilled to be here is also that I'm a, um, an MIT parent, and I have my son Eric, who's a junior in course six and living at a fraternity. All right, so, um, so we have a lot in common, and I look forward to uh, meeting those of you who I don't know. So if you see me around, please come and talk to me. We are, um, you know, con this year focusing on um, as we always do, continuously improving the program. So I'd love to hear about your experiences and any, of the, any suggestion you have about improvements that we can make. So let's turn it over to the business of today. So um, I'd like to introduce um, Chancellor Cynthia Barnhart um, as, as Chancellor of MIT. She has oversight and responsibility for graduate and undergraduate education at MIT, student life, student support services, and other areas that impact the student's experience. She and Provost Marty Schmidt are the Institute's two most senior academic officers. Um, together, they advise the president and participate in strategic planning, faculty appointments, resource development, and decision making around institute resources and buildings. Chancellor Barnhart has held this role since 2014. Prior to that, she was Associate Dean and Acting Dean in the School of Engineering, a Ford Foundation Professor of Engineering, and she's also a professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department. Chancellor Barnhart is also an MIT alumna, too, having earned a master's degree in transportation and a PhD in civil and environmental engineering. She joined the faculty here in 1992 and has been here ever since. So please join me in welcoming her now. Thank you, Hiana. And welcome everyone, it's Family Weekend 2017. It's great to see you here. It's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Professor Jean Tirol. He received his PhD here at MIT in 1981 in economics. Jean is the chairman of the Toulouse School of Economics and the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse. He is considered one of the most influential economists of our day. And he is also a visiting professor at MIT, a position he has held for 27 years. <laughs> In his research and teaching on economics, Professor Tyrell boldly confronts pressing challenges, global warming, unemployment, the digital revolution, and market regulation. It's no surprise that his most recent book is titled Economics for the Common Good. In this century, Professor T. Roll argues, we have found ourselves in the hands of a market economy. 
influencing that economy, which we must not see as an end in itself, towards a common good requires, and I quote, a reconciling, reconciling as far as possible of the interests of the individual with the general interest. Um, I'm really happy to tell you that copies of his latest book will be available outside this hall after lunch. And putting academics aside, Professor Tirol has always felt equal pulls between his homeland of France and the Boston area. He spends six weeks per year here teaching. He and his wife, Natalie, have three children, the first of whom was born here in Boston. Um, Professor Tirol is a laureate of numerous international distinctions, but today, the MIT Alumni Association is honoring, honoring him for his 2014 Nobel Prize in Economics. So I'm very pleased to welcome to the stage Professor Tyrrell. Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody. Thank you, Cynthia, for those kind of words. And I'm very honored to be giving this talk. And I'm very proud to be an MIT alumni and a former faculty and to be visiting every year uh, MIT because it's a, such a unique place in terms of culture. And as Cynthia has said, I'm chairing two institutions in Toulouse. And what we are trying to do really is to emulate as far as we can MIT because it's such a unique place. And I welcome you, the families, the future Nobel laureates, I hope, and, uh, and all those brilliant minds. Now, the book has 17 chapters. So I'm, I'm not going to go through the 17 chapters. I'm just going to choose one, actually. But at MIT, it, it fits very well. That's the one on the dig digital economy and the consequences for our societies trying to look forward. I mean, we have been developing, of course, models for platforms. As you all know, the platforms are the biggest firm nowadays, the five biggest market caps in the world, actually, are two-sided platforms, Google, Amazon, uh, Apple, Microsoft, and so on. But there is also a number of questions that we have to solve for the future of our societies, and I would like to say a few things about that. Now, don't worry. Uh, what you have learned at MIT or what you will learn at MIT is still valid in the new economy. Anytime you have a technological revolution, you have a certain number of impacts on consumers. We, as consumers, get better products, better quality, but they're also dangerous, of course. So, for example, with AI and genetics, there is a worry that insurers might use risk selection, so basically select the best risk and leave those with the bad genes and the bad luck with no insurance at all. We have to think about that. It's going to affect firms with the entry of new players, which is going to challenge, they are going to challenge incumbents. Um, there is no overstating the importance of competition. You have seen Uber or Lyft, whatever you think about it in terms of social security contribution and the like, there is still the point that a number of, his, of their innovations hadn't been implemented by taxi monopolies in the past, even so those innovations were extremely, extremely minor and well known. And finally, it's going to impact workers with job destructions and job creations. And the new thing, I think, is that the job destruction is going to go faster and faster. Are we up to the challenge? So I would like to mention a couple of topics. One is the future of labor. Maybe talk a little bit about taxes on robots, which are very popular. Talk about competition policy challenges, which, of course, we economists have to design and think about. And I'll say a few words about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. So let me start with the future of labor. And there are really two challenges. The first challenge is, is this the end of unemployment, of employment, I'm sorry, as we know it? So is there going to be an expansion of independent work and disappearance of salaried work? 
It's hard to tell. My guess is that there will be an expansion of independent work for good reasons. And one of the reasons is that now individuals can build reputations for themselves. Just think about the Uber driver. This Uber driver, thanks to the ratings, can have his or own reputation. Before, the reputation was at the level of the taxi company, not of the individual driver. So with the new technologies, you can build your own reputation and therefore build a firm. You can have a cheap back office. You can directly contact the customers. And all of that is going actually to favor some kind of independent work. At the same time, we have to realize that there are good reasons for why salaried work will remain. People are risk averse, and being independent, of course, involves a lot of risk. To start a firm, sometimes, it depends on the activity, you need a lot of money, and then you may not be able to borrow. You have to rely on being financed by a firm. The firm may have to offer guarantees. There may be confidentiality issues. So for example, the boss may not like the worker to work for other bosses because there might be trade secrets. So we still might have um, salaried work in the future. Also, my guess, it's going to disappear. Now, as you all know, there are lots of debates about are Uber drivers, for example, independent workers or salaried workers? Or should they be, actually? Should they be treated one way or the other? And to be honest, my view in this debate is that it's going nowhere because there are some decisions which are taken by the Uber driver, for example, when they drive. That's one example. But there are some other decisions which are taken by Uber, the prices, for example, or how clean the cars are, and so on and so forth. So in the end, you can go back and forth, and I don't think you can resolve this issue. In a sense, I would say we don't care. We don't care because what we want is a level playing field. We economists or the government don't have to decide whether independent work or salaried work is better. In a sense, it's up to the market to decide. But for the market to function well, it must be the case that you have a level playing field so that the social security contribution, the taxes, the pension rights, and so on, health insurance are the same for everybody. And then it's up to the drivers to decide how they want to organize. So that's the first challenge, but there's a much bigger challenge, which is, is there going to be work in the future anymore? Are we going to be, most of us, going to be unemployed? And we see, actually, jobs being destroyed. Um, algorithms may work with deductive rules, so you go from a general rule, and then you apply, you know, putting the ingredients in there. For, for example, an ATM machine is a well-known algorithm. You just have to give the information, and then it withdraws the money from your bank account. That's very simple. Computers do that very easily. But with AI now, we can do the other way around. We can do the inductive rule and start from, from Casey's example and try to deduct some general rule. But either way, we see that jobs are being destroyed. And many people in our societies actually fear that they won't have a job tomorrow. Now, we economists are always suspicious about this argument because yeah, it's true that one economist, Keynes, actually predicted there would be no job by 1965. Now, still we are suspicious because we all think, always think there will be new jobs created, and that will be the case again this time. There are two questions, really. The first question is, will the jobs that are created Basically, will they attract, will it be they attractive uh, to the workers? So, the, for example, in terms of pay or the kind of jobs that are created, will they want to take them? And the second thing is that technological mutations require adjustment costs. And we know that, for example, from globalization, actually, people at MIT and elsewhere have shown that with globalization, the Chinese imports in the US have uh, made China richer, of course, but also the U U.S. richer, except that if you were living in the Midwest, then you got stranded. So there were new jobs which were created, but they were not the same jobs, and they were created elsewhere. And that's going to happen more and more, and that means that it's going to fuel the populist uh, movements 
in the future even more. That brings me to the tax on robots. Some people like Bill Gates have proposed a tax on robots and they have said basically if a worker you know, works for $50,000 of work and pays social security contribution and taxes, why doesn't, doesn't a robot, which does exactly the same work, also pay the taxes? So the idea is to pay a tax on robot. This is not a well-specified specif argument, but you could say, given that there will be a cost of adjustment, you might be tempted to put some sand in the wheels so that the mutations are slower and slower over time. But there are arguments against the tax on robots. The first argument is obvious, is that if you slow down technological progress, you are going to end up with a, lower, a smaller pie to share. You know, technological progress increases the pie, and if we slow it down, of course, there is less wealth to share among the people. The second argument is that there could be offshoring. So if a country puts a tax on robots, the danger, of course, is that the production will take place in another country which doesn't put a tax on robots. Now, you could say we could have import duties which reflect the robot content. But how do you know what the robot content is? By the way, for those of you who are interested, and I'm sure all of you are interested in the environment, the same thing occurs when you have a carbon tax or carbon price. In your country, you do what, what it takes to fight climate change. You have a decent carbon price, which we don't have anywhere in the world except in Sweden. Uh, the carbon price is way too low to fight climate change, that we know. Um, but you do it in your country alone. What happens is, of course, that there is a migration of the production to other countries, and then you import back. And we don't know how to measure the carbon content. And you might actually put a tax on goods and import duty on goods, which are actually produced with green technologies, which makes no sense. So there's an information prime. And more generally, there is a bureaucratic prime with a robot tax. What is a tax base? Some of you, I'm sure, know what a robot means. There is a well-defined notion of robots, but this notion is actually very narrow. So for example, computers, ATMs, cranes, vaccines that destroy the jobs of, of doctors, fluoride, which destroys the jobs, jobs of dentists, right? They're all labor savings innovation, and we will not tax them if we tax robots. So that's, that's actually very difficult. Where do you stop? What is a robot? Is that, and in a sense, we don't care what is a robot, what is a computer, what is whatever. We care about labor, labor saving uh, innovations because they might displace jobs. And also you have to know if this job is destroyed, can you re-employ uh, the worker in a similar occupation or is this worker completely lost and has to be retrained from scratch? So looking forward, we, we, we have to, looking ahead, we have to think about what we are going to do because the big picture, of course, is that we are going to be much richer and much healthier. But what may happen, of course, is that there will be a lot of difficulties, both with gig jobs, you know, the jobs which are poorly paid, lots of discontent, lots of issues with antitrust, and et cetera. So we have to think about it. Now, let me say one thing, which is, I think, very important in the reaction. Of course, that's not the issue in the US now, but it might become an issue. And you don't want to go the way Southern Europe, for example, has done, which is protect jobs rather than protecting workers. The Scandinavians, for example, have understood that it's much better to protect the worker than protecting the job. But that lesson is going to become more and more important over time because the job destruction will be faster and faster. So who is going to create a permanent job nowadays, given that the type of jobs which are around are going to be destroyed within five years or something like that? This is impossible. You know, in France, we protect the jobs, 
The consequence of that is then 90% of the job creations are actually short-term jobs, you know, one month or something like that, that leads to an un unemployment and the like, which are very inefficient. It's already 90%. In the future, it will be 95 or 98% because no firm will want to create a permanent job. But we have to protect the workers, and that's actually very important, with good retraining, good unemployment insurance benefits, and so on and so forth. We have to improve education, and of course, I should not say that at MIT because, of course, you are already at the top of the educational scale. Uh, it's a wonderful institution, but we, you know, overall, we do a poor job in our countries uh, to educate the mass of people, and we have to take that into account. We have to improve retraining. We have to make our tax more progressive while keeping work, work incentive, and we have to prop up antitrust enforcement. And let me say a few words about antitrust enforcement because, of course, that's an area where economists are doing a lot of research. Lots of people ask me, should we break up Google? And, you know, it's not an easy proposition, of course. We used to break up, you broke up at and in 1984. Um, most electricity companies have been broken up into generation, transmission grid, distribution. That's relatively easy. It's relatively easy because the technology doesn't change very fast. Breaking up a firm takes several years. And when the technology changes all the time, and on top of that, when the input like data are shared by different services, it's very hard to break up the firm. You have to monitor acquisition, and that's not easy to do, but you want the big firms not to swallow up their future competitors. You know, in terms of venture capital, you have two ways of exiting for venture capitalists and, and entrepreneurs. One is to have an IPO. The other one is to sell to another firm. But of course, if you sell to your competitor, then it's a merger to monopoly. It's a reduction in competition, which is, of course, something we don't like. So we have to deal with that. We have to make sure that those markets are contestable. So you want the new and efficient entrants uh, to be able to enter on a market niche. Don't forget that Google actually started on a market niche. Google enters the search engine market. Amazon just was selling books at the start. And the, the strategy of all those firms actually to start in a given segment and then extend uh, more broadly to different segments. And for that, you must not have the incumbents, the very powerful firms, which benefit from network societies and increasing return to scale. Uh, you don't want them to bundle their products so that the entrants cannot enter in any segment. And you have to devise new regulation. Just give me an, let me give you an example which will be familiar with you. You book on booking.com. You, book, you come from this weekend. You know, for those of you who are not from the Boston region, you book an hotel on booking.com. Now, booking.com will promise you the best price. There is a best price guarantee. So if you book through Expedia or if you book directly from the hotel, you won't get a better price. At least it's like that in many countries. Fine. It looks very good for the consumer, right? You, you should benefit a lot from that. That's not true. That's not true because if Booking.com first gives you the best price for all hotels, and all hotels on Booking.com, then you're not going to look anywhere else. If you're a customer of Booking, you're never going to go anywhere else. You'll get the best price and you get all hotels. So you stay on Booking.com, you're a unique customer. And now, Booking.com, whatever its market share, 20%, but it could be 2% or 80%, can go and see the hotel and say, now you have to pay 20% or 25%. Because if you don't pay, you never reach those customers. And actually, the 20 25% are not paid so much by the Booking.com customers, but actually by the customers we don't use Booking.com because it's a uniform price. And so the cost of the 20 25% is passed through to other customers. And actually, that raises price as opposed to lower price. And that's why in, in Europe, for example, we have taken a stance to moderate uh, the fees which were charged by those platforms. 
but it's a more general thing. I mean, I'm, I'm not be beating on Booking.com because Booking.com actually supplies a very good service, but you have to realize that all platforms in the economy do that. And we have to think about regulation, which actually rewards innovation, rewards investment, but doesn't reward the abuse of monopoly power or market power. Let me say a few things about blockchain and cryptocurrencies. And I don't know what you're feeling at MIT are, but my own view is that crypto, the blockchain is a wonderful technology. It has a lot of future, a very bright future, because it's safe, it's fast. And by the way, in finance, it's very important to be fast because you save on collateral. But Bitcoin is a different thing. So as an economist, my vision of Bitcoin is much less positive than my vision of blockchain. Bitcoin has some socially undesirable features. So for example, the Bitcoin actually is a bubble, just like any fiat currency. So if in this room we all decide that Bitcoin has no value, it will have no value. There is no fundamental value behind Bitcoin. It's just a self-fulfilling phenomenon, which may be possible, of course, but is very unstable. And that, by the way, you see the price of Bitcoin as being very volatile. That's a concern. Second concern is, of course, that the social value is not quite the same as a pride value because Bitcoin, unfortunately, is used for purposes, for good purposes, but there are also some people who use it for money laundering, illegal activities, and tax evasion. And finally, there's something you may not have thought about, is the production technology. Economists call that senior age. Senior age means that you issue currency, and then you get the, the money from the issuance. Okay, so if you issue dollars or euros or yens, basically the government gets the money. That's called senior age, and that's a good thing because it goes into the hands of the community. Whereas with ICO, with initial coin offerings, the money goes into private hands. Actually, it's much worse than that because part of the money is completely wasted. ICO is going to go into private hands but when you have the 14 pools, big pools of miners, spending a huge amount of money in equipment and electricity to be faster than the others, then it's completely wasted. You know, it's, it's really rent grabbing, and that money that they get by getting new bitcoins is actually wasted through investment in equipment and electricity. And there are lots of other challenges for Bitcoin, which are extremely interesting for business people and economists, you know, the two-sided market uh, aspect. How do you create B2C with Bitcoins? They don't have the right model right now. And, and I could talk about that. Um, the possibility of forking we have seen on Bitcoin, for example. You know, the idea, just like in you know, open source software, that you might have different branches, incompatible branches developing and you lose the network externality that goes with the technology. The governance structure is actually very exciting for an economist, you know, just to think about what kind of governance structure you like to have for Bitcoin, but more generally for all blockchain endeavors. And let me conclude, and I would, like, I would be very happy to have some Q&A and, and, and exchange with you. Um, let me conclude with one or two words about um, supervise machine learning, which of course is a big topic, and again, MIT is at the forefront of that. So far, machine learning has been used mainly for predictive purposes. So they look at your consumption, they look at the consumption of similar people, where similarity has to be defined, of course, but similar people, and they give you a prediction that you might like this book or you might like this movie, right? That's one of the purposes of same thing with face recognition and many other uses of AI. This is all good, but that's not sufficient. And the future, in my view, and you know, even so, I was trained as an engineer, actually, before being an economist, um, but I'm not competent at all, unlike you. Um, 
you know, my own view is that there are other things you want to do, and you want to have a more structural approach, put more seer into it, in order to make AI even more efficient. Why? The first thing is that you always have value judgment. So if you want to allocate a scarce resource, you know, machine learning is not going to tell you what to do. You have at some point to decide what you want to do. You have to distinguish between correlation and causality. By the way, by the way, in those populist times, I think we should educate our children to actually learn what the distinction between correlation and causality, because correlations are the best narrative you can give, which is often completely wrong. Now, if you see, for example, that the hotel price and occupancy rates goes up at the same time, so they are correlated. So you observe that at the same time the hotel price goes up and the occupancy goes up. You might deduct that actually to raise occupancy you should raise your price. And you know, we all know that if you raise your price, you're unlikely to raise occupancy. But of course, what's wrong is to interpret a correlation as a causality and there is a common factor driving both, of course, which is you know, demand, uh, demand shifts, of course. Uh, so if there's a regatta in Boston, of course, then there will be high demand for hotels, there will be high occupancy and high prices, but that doesn't mean that a hotel can raise occupancy by raising price. Just teaching that to high school students, I think, will be wonderful. But more, more to the point, I think it's very important uh, that we enrich um, we enrich our knowledge uh, in machine learning by trying to get more causality into it. And finally, there are always missing data. And when there are missing data, of course, AI has, is limited. But you know, the incredible progress which has been realized, and now you see uh, machines actually playing poker, behaving like humans, right? Go and chess is easy in a sense, but yeah, easy. You know, but playing poker, it's game theory. You know, and you have behavioral things, you have mixed strategies, you have all those things. It's, a, it's actually exciting to see that actually m machines actually are trying, to, uh, are beginning to mimic humans. It's also a bit scary, I must say, but uh, it's wonderful uh, looking uh, forward. So there are lots of other topics, and as I told you, and just I'm going to conclude there, there are issues which have to do with politics, there are issues which have to do with inequality. Um, we have a very bright future, and you are our future. Um, ahead of us, we'll live much healthier life, we'll be much richer. But there are also some social consequences of this technological progress, which if we don't anticipate them, we may get into big trouble. So I just wanted to conclude with that. We need to think in societal terms, in terms of human and social sciences, as well as in terms of engineering. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that uh, very informative talk. Uh, myself, I'm an, I'm an engineer, and when I'm developing products, I often think about developing products for the sake of developing the products, not really always thinking about the impacts on society and uh, the economy. Um, but on a different topic, a question I'd like to ask you is, what was it like to win the award and the uh, Nobel ceremony in Sweden, and how has one winning the award changed your life? Well, I recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful thing. So, um, I, you know, you get, you get won like an hour in advance before the press conference. There's a press conference in Stockholm. And you get this call from people you don't know, actually. And you always wonder if it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, you know, they put you through with some people you know and you know their voice. So at that point of time, you know it's true. And of course, you try to, to call, uh, I call my wife, Natalie, and I call my mother. And we, 90, she was 91 at the time. I told her to sit first. <laughs> because I, I, 
and then you know, everything is gets completely crazy, but it's it's very moving. Uh, that's just for the anecdote, of course. And you know, the the welcome of the, the faculty. I've lived that at MIT as well, because the economic de economic department is is an incredibly it's number one department and has had Nobel prizes. And uh, we have lived through that experience at MIT, and and then that was my own experience. And it's very moving. And then you know, you you get. It was a big thing in Toulouse, so I got stopped in the street, and that's going to bring me to the next item. I got stopped in the street by people, sometimes even crying. They were so proud to have a Nobel Prize. And they put, actually, on the city hall, there is a very beautiful city hall in Toulouse, they put a huge banner, like 12 meters by seven or something, that was covering part of the city hall with my face for two weeks. And, <laughs> and, and then the Philharmonic actually played uh, played for me in my honor in front of 2,000 people um, the day before I left for Stockholm. You know, that, those are kind of things that uh, you don't forget, and the suites were wonderful, of course. It's a full week, by the way. For those of you who will, will be in this situation, prepare yourself, because it's very exhausting. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, first, for two months, you don't sleep. You, don't, you just wonder what happened to you. But then, it's seven full, seven full days where you're occupied all day long, and it's, it's just wonderful, but you know, some people actually fall sick uh, <laughs> because it's so exhausting. But let me let be more serious. Um, what, I, what it brought to me, and I wrote a lot of books in the past. I also engage in policy a lot. I've been belonging for 25 years uh, to the French Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, working with companies, working with ministries and regulatory agencies and central banks and so on. But I never engage with a wider public. And, you know, some of the people who stopped me in the street actually, uh, actually basically said, I tried to read stuff from you and it's completely unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and that's, that's true. And, but also, I, I also think that uh, I had a duty actually to communicate. And let me be more serious about that because. I think in retrospect, I wrote it, um, you know, it first, was first published in French, and uh, then there was the year of 2016. And you know, this expansion of populism all over the world, okay, is very damaging. And I understood at that point of time that, you know, talking to experts in ministries, in companies, and so on, is not going to do it. That's necessary, but it's not sufficient. At some point, we need to actually have a shared knowledge of how economics works. And not only economics, I will, I will say that for climate change, I will say that for medicine, and for many other fields, any field which has some connection with the public, we need to have an education, and we need to have a respect for experts. You know, in, in the UK, in France, all the populists actually always say, I'm talking to the people, I don't want to talk to the expert, we are fed up with the expert. Now, sometimes the experts deserve it. You know, we have to get our act together sometimes, but mostly those people don't want to engage in a debate because they want to spread fake news, they want to be able to spread uh, wrong reasonings, wrong policies, and we have a social duty as, as intellectual actually to, to help. And you know, that's a way in which the Nobel Prize actually changed my life. Uh, thank you very much for your speech. It was extremely informative. I have a question on the impact of robots. Uh, let's think of a, an extreme scenario where all the jobs in the world have been replaced by robots. And so uh, the metric you use for the economic GDP is produced completely by robots. This is a good problem to have, no? You will have a, a world where politicians, with the help of economists, the only job they will have, the only task they will have, will be how to distribute the surplus produced by machines. So maybe the path to that extreme state will be bumpy, but maybe it's a good objective to have. Well, thank you for your question. Um, Tax on robots. First, I don't think, as I said, I don't think jobs are going to disappear. The only question 
is whether there will be jobs that people want to take. So we still new, need human contacts, right? Now, take an example, and I don't have the answer, and to be honest, by the way, in the book, I explained that economists are good at certain things, and I think even very good at certain things and very bad at some other things, and predicting is actually not the best thing they do. Uh, no, I, I'm not kidding. It's just like a doctor or a seismologist. Um, you know, you can say you should not do that or this is a factor of risk. But when you ask them, am I going to have a heart attack or will there be an earthquake and when, you know, they, they get silent. And this, it's, the economists are like that to some extent on some, uh, some things. So we can tell you um, we have reduced the probability of uh, another banking crisis, but have we limited it? We don't know because things change fast. We don't always have the data are serious, are too simplistic and so on. But take an example. So a general practitioner, a doctor, in a couple of years will be competing against algorithm, which have lots of data in it, um, genetics, and so on and so forth. So, so their job is going to become in part obsolete. So what will they do? I mean, maybe they will uh, also, I think this will still be part of the process, but they will have a different job. And I think the human contacts, the check on hacking, et cetera, et cetera, is going to remain. Uh, but the jobs are going to change. And I cannot predict, as an economist, I cannot predict what they are going to become. And they are, you know, we, we don't know much, really, I think. But I think they will still be around. But the, the issue is the polarization, the fact that there are lots of jobs which have poor pay today. It's already true today. I mean, uh, basically, there has been a hollowing out of the income distribution with people who have high instruction actually doing very well, and the others are seeing their wage stagnate, and that's going to, to keep going. Now, you talk about redistributing, and we can, we can do that to some extent um, through a universal income tax, but don't forget two things. The first is people have the dignity. I mean, you can be in Saudi Arabia, and you, you can redistribute the oil rent through a kind of fake job in the civil service, but, uh, you know, it's not that pleasant. You want to think that you are useful to society. And that will be our challenge so that people feel they are useful to society. But also, another difference I want to note is that the oil rent stays in the ground. You can do whatever you want. It, still, it will still be there, unless there is a big enough carbon price. But other than that, it's going to stay in the ground. The rent that you get from biotech, from AI and from other things, innovation, is completely mobile. And it's endogenous. It relies on top universities. It relies on entrepreneurship. And it relies on keeping the people. Okay, And that's also going to be an issue because, as you know, the income distribution worldwide has become actually more equal, thanks to China and India. But in the future, it might diverge again. Again, I don't know, but it's a possibility that we have to consider. So those are the things we have to think through, uh, you know, given the challenges. I'm sorry, I'm told there is one more question. Uh, thank you for your uh, insightful remarks. I appreciate it. I had a question about AI. Uh, a lot of very smart folks in the world, Stephen Hawking, Elon Musk, to name just two, are worried about an intelligence explosion where you build an AI system that's actually smart enough to build another AI system that's smarter than itself. And if that happens, it starts getting out of control very fast. Do you think that's actually a real concern for people to worry about? I honestly don't know, to be honest. I mean, you at MIT should know, <laughs> right? <laughs> I, 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 just, I just don't know. I mean, the, the thing is that AI will do extremely well if, if it has data, right? And I think what we, what we economists and we social scientists can do, actually, and scientists more generally, you know, when you do research, is to find new things. And by the way, I forgot to mention one reason for why you have to put more theory into AI. When you do a policy intervention, a public policy intervention, behaviors change. That's a, an old topic in economics. You do a change in a public policy, the behavior of people change. So you cannot rely on the past behavior to predict the future one. You need to put more structure. And that's the kind of thing for which humans are actually doing very well. 
Now, you could mimic that over time. You, know, you, could, you could try to learn how people change their behavior as a function of the public policy, but you always consider new policies. And just you know, when Soviet Union desegregated, we had to predict what would happen. It was completely new. We had never experienced that. If you want to deregulate electricity market all at once, you know, it had never happened. You had to have theories to try to understand. You could not just use past data to try to predict what would happen. And of course, the behavior changed, and that's exactly what, what was foreseen. That's the kind of thing that where we still will have, but it will be a small number of people, and that's what worries me, that it will be a small number of people who will still be able to do that. Thank you so much on behalf of MIT. We very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was a, it was a great honor to address this audience, and uh, have a great weekend too. Goodbye.